Now, for a very long time, we've been talking about how Trump has Andrew Jackson hanging in his office. And we know that Andrew Jackson went up against the central bank. That was his whole entire campaign to remove the central bank. And that's exactly what he did. And we've been saying that Trump, his entire push is to get to the source of the entire problem. And that is the central bank. And in this report, we're going to discuss the plan on how he's going to get rid of the central bank. And we can see it's already forming. And this is why Trump was out there and the Patriots. This is why they were talking about, oh, we're very angry about the Fed raising interest rates. Let them do what they need to do. They know what to do. And this was a setup. This was the beginning stages. Then we had Q come out and talk about the Fed right after that. There's a reason for all of this. And we're going to be going through this a little bit later in this report. But first, let's look at the economy. Now, the economy around the world, it is falling apart very, very quickly. And we need to keep this in mind that this economy is not going to last that much longer. Now, the central banks know this. Trump and the Patriots know this. Everything's starting to collapse very, very quickly. And these bubbles that we've been blowing up for these many, many years, they're starting to pop. And we're starting to see this all over here in the United States, Canada, Australia, Europe, out in Australia, what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing the housing bubble pop. Now, we're looking at Sydney right now. And Sydney, Australia, this is the largest housing market, one of the world's biggest housing bubbles. Prices of homes of all types fell 5.4% in July compared to a year ago, and 5.5% from the peak in September. Prices of single-family houses dropped 7%, and prices of condos fell 1.6%. Now, what we're seeing is prices are now coming down in Australia, in Sydney. We're seeing it in Canada. We're seeing it in the U.S. We're starting to see it actually in Europe also, U.K. We're starting to see it all over the place. And what is happening is people don't know what to do. Think about... 2006, 2007. Remember the beginning stages when prices started to fall? They hit a peak and then all of a sudden prices started to come down a little bit. Nobody knew what to do. All of a sudden traffic started to dry up. If you were trying to sell your house, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And those people might might have been in a different area and didn't see it, but later on, boy, did they see it. We're starting to see the beginning stages of all this. And we're seeing it not just here in the U.S., but around the world. We've been tracking this, and we've hit the peak. Now we're coming off the peak. People are going to start taking their houses off the market. People are going to be underwater because they've been purchasing homes at the peak of the market. And those people back in 2006, 7, and 8 who bought at the peak, well, they're going to be, while well, they're underwater now, they're going to still be underwater as we move forward. Out in Melbourne, we see the same exact thing and it's a little bit behind sydney but right there home prices in melbourne fell 0.5 percent in july year over year and if, this is all coming from core logic they're looking at all this and are down three percent from their peak at the end of 27 november 2017 house prices fell 1.4 percent from a year ago while condos well they're holding steady right now so it's hitting each steady each city one at a time. We've seen this happen back in 2006, 7, and 8 here in the United States. All of a sudden, up in New York, that's where I was. Housing prices just came down. Traffic dried up. Nobody knew what was going on. But if we looked at different parts of the country at the same exact time, like in Miami, everything was still booming. But guess what happened about eight or nine months later? Well, everything came to a standstill. And we're going to see the same exact thing happen once again. We see that in aggregate, the five capital cities index in Australia fell 2.4% in July year over year. Now, May was the first month with a year over year decline since October 2012. The index has now declined month to month for 10 months in a row and is down 3.1% from the peak in October last year. So, this whole thing is spreading, it's coming down, and there's going to be major, major problems. And 
if it was just in one little tiny area, not that big of a deal yet, but we're seeing this all over the place. We're seeing it in Australia now that we've just been talking about. We talked about Canada. We're seeing it there. We're seeing it in Europe, and we're seeing it in the United States. We mentioned that about Case Shiller, how we hit the peak. Prices are starting to come down. Mortgage rates are moving up. Applications are down. It's all starting to happen, and it's happening all at once. And this is going to continue on. It's not going to just stop and reverse. It is going to get worse. And guess what? The central bankers know this. Trump, the patriots know this. Other leaders know this. They know exactly what's going on. And it's falling apart rapidly. They knew that they only had a window of time before everything started to fall apart. Now, we've been talking about retail, how retail was a complete and utter disaster. Now, we talked about this way before the retail apocalypse, but this is continuing. And it's not because everyone's going to online and purchasing everything online, because that would be a one-to-one -one ratio or very, very close. We're, it's not even close to it. But what we're, see, what we're seeing happen right now, there are more retailers that might go bankrupt. They're very, very close to this. And using the credit risk monitor, there's a gauge here. It's a Frisk score, and it indicates a 9.99% to 50% chance of bankruptcy in 12 months. And when we look at this, we can see there are certain stores that are showing that they have this score, and they're very close to bankruptcy. A lot of these stores have kind of gotten around bankruptcy by doing some you know, manipulation, some fancy financial work to get around it, but it never lasts. Now, we know that Bonton, Toys R Us, and many of the stores, they went completely bankrupt. J. Crew right now is a bankruptcy candidate. If we look at them, net losses for 2017 widened to 125 million from 23.5 million the year before. In the fourth quarter, sales at that retailer's flagship brand fell 4%. Neiman Marcus is also a candidate. We see Neiman Marcus top line sales in fiscal 2017 fell around 5% to 4.7 billion compared to 2016. And that's very tough for a retailer that has about 4.8 billion debt pile. JC Penney, we know they're right up there. We also know that Sears is right there. GNC, their revenue has dropped 3.4%. 99 cent stores. Same thing. They had a third quarter net loss of $27.1 million. BB. Well, last year, BB paid out around $65 million to dissolve its physical retail footprint. The move helped to avoid bankruptcy, but guess what? They're not doing well, and it looks like they're heading in that same direction. So this retail apocalypse is continuing. It has not ended. And you have to remember, People who don't have jobs or people who are making less money, not getting raises, we know that wages are falling, they're not going out and spending money. This is the big problem. This is the one thing the central bankers couldn't fix. They couldn't go out and make people spend their funds. Yes, to purchase a car or a home, they can loan them the money, and this way you don't have to put anything down, nothing comes out of your pocket and they can put off maybe your payments for a month or two but what happens is later on you see the delinquencies start to rise because they really couldn't afford this and this is what we are seeing in the automobile industry we see delinquencies they're in they're they're, they're moving up they're rising and car sales right now they are tumbling remember we talked about channel stuffing how the american automobile makers they were stuffing the cars on the lots that was considered a sale not when you sell a car to someone when you actually bring the car to the dealer if you bring a lot of cars to the dealer those are considered sales all these numbers are manipulated one way or another and we're looking at the major manufacturers they reported a sharp drop in US deliveries for July led by a 15 percent plunge at Nissan Motors
Now, they have their reasons that they're putting out there of why this is happening, but we've been tracking this, and this is why we bring up all these important parts of how the automobile channel stuff lots. Remember, these sales were never real. They allowed people to come in with subprime credit and then sub-subprime credit just to move the merchandise, to make it look like things are on the up and up. Now they're saying, well, it's happening because of the auto tariffs. It's happening because what Trump is doing. This is the excuse that they're using. General Motors, their sales have fallen to 3.3% last month, the same drop as Ford. And when we look at this entire situation, and as we move forward with all these retailers closing, because we have the corporate offices, we have the stores, these individuals are not going to be going out purchasing cars. And think about how many stores, how many employees have been laid off. Some are full-time, some are part-time. And once again, if you were working part-time and you weren't working a certain number of hours or getting a certain number of pay, you're not counted as being laid off. But on the flip side, if you got a part-time job, they counted you as a full-time worker. If you had two part-time jobs, you had two full-time jobs. And that's how they counted you. So you can see how this is all um, manipulated to make you think that things are going very well. We see that durable goods, they were revised, and they said durable goods were up 1%. We showed that, no, that was military spending. They were actually down, but they even lowered them now to 0.8%, including the military uh, spending. And we see already that the durable goods, these are the big ticket items like washers, dryers, and things like that. People are not going out and purchasing these items. So when we look at the economy as a whole right now in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, in Australia, we see everything starting to fall apart. Now, people are starting to take notice now. I mean, before, no one realized what was going on. You know, oh, you, you hear that the economy's not doing well, but the statistical numbers, they show that they, they are doing well. Now people are starting to realize there's something wrong. Many individuals are saying that business is starting to slow down now. And we're starting to see this in many different areas. Now, of course, the corporate media is getting on to this, saying that housing is starting to slow, and they have a different agenda. They're saying this is all because of Trump. No, what's happening is we're coming to the end of the central banking system. They propped it up for a little while longer, but they were expecting someone else in the White House, and they were going to bring us to war or have some type of an event to explain away why all this is happening. The problem is they can't do it now. So we have Trump and the Patriots in the White House, and the plan right now is to take over the Federal Reserve and eventually get rid of it or control it and have we the people control it, create the currency without interest, and maybe eventually get rid of it. So what is the plan? What is the plan here? Well, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve is required to have seven members. How many does it have right now? Three. Two of the current governors were put into their position by Trump. Two more have been nominated by the President and are awaiting confirmation by the Senate. After these two are put on the Fed board, the President will then nominate two more to follow them. In essence, it is possible that six of the seven board members will be put in place by Trump. Now, the President can and will take control of the Fed. It may be recalled when the law was written, creating the Federal Reserve, the Secretary of the Treasury was designated as the head of the Federal Reserve. We're going to return to that error. Returning the Fed to the Treasury control means more than appointing new board members. It means nationalizing the central bank, making it a public utility responsive to the needs of the public and the economy. And that means modifying the Federal Reserve Act to change the Fed's mandate and tools. Now, there were certain presidents that attempted to do this. John Kennedy, Abraham Lincoln, and two other 
assassinated presidents James Garfield, William McKinley, prior to Nixon, had actively contemplated changes of such magnitude in the U.S. financial system. President Garfield observed that whoever controls the volume of money in our country is absolute master of all industry and commerce, and when you realize that the entire money system is very easily controlled, one way or another by a few powerful men, you will not have to be told how periods of inflation and depression originate. And again, the central bankers, they play dirty. They're not just going to let it happen. It's not going to be easy, as we can see in the past. We had John F. Kennedy. He issued a silver certificate, put it out there. Abraham Lincoln issued the greenback. And anyone that attempts to get rid of the central bank, well, it usually doesn't end well for them. So we see at this point we are headed in this direction. And this was the plan from the very beginning because you need to cut off the funding to the deep state. The root of all of this is the central bank. Now, yes, there are many different central banks. There's the ECB, there's the Fed, but we need to get to the top the central banks of central banks, the biz. But you need to start somewhere and you need to work your way up and you need to show other countries what you need to do. And once you start doing this and all countries band together and say, you know something, we don't need these central banks. We will control the creation of currency. Well, what is the central bank of all central banks going to do? They don't have any power then over the governments because they're not in debt. We're headed in that direction. This is the plan. And I do believe there will be an audit bill. I believe that Trump will then pass that bill. And the narrative right now is being constructed and pushed to blame this on the Fed. Now, of course, the Fed has other plans because central bankers, they just don't like to give up control. They're creating their own narrative. And this is what we're going to see. The battle for the narrative has just begun. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And we can see that we are headed in this direction. Just like everything else, it doesn't happen with the snap of a finger. You have to be strategic. You have to work in a certain direction. Just like everything else we're seeing. But slowly but surely, we're going to see it happen. And this is why you need to be ready and prepared. Because once we go into this transition mode, things are going to be a little crazy. In the beginning in 1971, when we were transitioning into the petrodollar coming off the gold standard, people got hurt. People didn't have jobs. People couldn't get fuel. There were blackouts in other countries. And we're going to see something like that. Actually, probably a little bit worse because most likely we're not going to be the reserve currency anymore. And we're not coming off a gold standard. We're going the opposite way. We have all this debt. We have everything based on the central bank system. And we need to reverse it. And that's going to go through a little bit of a pain, a little bit of pain for many, many people. And you're going to need to be prepared and ready for this pain.